Dr. Jim Casty. Um, he works at uh, William and Mary out of Virginia right now. Huh? Is this? Okay. And um, he's an associate professor there. Um, he got his undergrad in SUNY Geneseo and then his master's in uh, Maine Morno. But cosmogenic radionuclides started in the PhD program at Dartmouth, which is where he and I met. I just got my master's, he got his PhD. So he's going to talk about a type of cosmogenic radionuclide called sodium. But before that, I know there's just some, Jim and I have been friends for about 15 years, and we've done a lot together. Jim uh, built his own little sugar shack in his backyard, and this is us uh, getting ready to boil some sap in New Hampshire. This is me just about to score on Jimbo with his ball, <laughs> trying hard to stop me, but he just can't. Um, we've also spent some time, in, uh, he took a field class out to Grand Canyon, and we spent some time out in Grand Canyon. And this is us just about through on the north rim? Yep. Yeah. And um, I was leaving with this, you know, Jim through academics and even through uh, personal stuff. No matter what he's doing, it's always a good time to be with him. So with that, I'll put on this presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. And uh, we'll start. I can't. Okay. <clears throat> All right, well, thanks, Todd. Yeah, let me just check that real quick. OK, and thank you for inviting me here. I've had a, a nice visit so far. And um, am I speaking loud enough for everyone to hear me? A little OK, a little louder. So today I'm going to speak with you about um, my efforts and the efforts of a lot of my students at William & Mary um, to measure cosmogenic sodium-22, which is a naturally occurring cosmogenic isotope of sodium, uh, in rainfall and also in stream waters and in groundwaters. And we're trying to develop the use of this tool as a way to date uh, waters to be able to figure out how old water is. Um, and so. Um, I'm going to sort of give you, give you some of the data that we've collected so far, and um, I'm interested in some feedback on how this tool might be applied if it indeed serves out to be an effective tracer of water transport. Okay, so the research question, which I think is really important, is how old is water? And I'm going to define old here, or I'm, I'm going to define what the age is by saying the water, it's, it's the age is when the water was last precipitation. Okay, so imagine if you had um, a stream here, this is a stream from Colorado, or a groundwater sample being sampled by Elena Burton, one of my uh, former students at William & Mary, um, <clears throat> from Shenandoah National Park, or this nice uh, stream that we have a nice fly fisherman there in New Hampshire, when was that water last precipitation? Right, that's, that's how I'm gonna define the age of water determining when it was last precipitation. When was that last uh, snow? When was this last rainfall over the Shenandoahs? And when was this all, you know, snow or rainfall? So currently, we have a few ways to do this. Um, there are some accepted ways to measure the age of water. Um, one way is to use tritium. And tritium was a weapons pulse in the 1960s. And um, that's one way that some folks can measure um, water ages, or that's how it is, is commonly accepted way to, to do that. We had basically a peak in the 60s, and then it came back down. Um, so if you find water with concentrations of tritium way up here, you know that the water was um, so, sort of formed sometime in the early 1960s. Beyond that, there are some other contaminant gases that are used to determine the age of water. Um, CFCs and SF6, these are trace pollutants that are in the atmosphere and to equilibrate with water. And the US Geo Geological Survey has developed some ways to use these as a way to age water as well. But these methods have some drawbacks and, and uh, weaknesses. Another way that you can determine the age of water is to um, use time series data of solutes or of, of water isotopes. Um, so here's some example of how you have a precipitation signal of del 18 in rainfall, and after it wake, makes its way through the catchment, the signal gets smoothed a little bit, and you can do basically the Fourier transform style analysis on this and get a frequency distribution of transit times using very high resolution um, chemical measurements of rainfall and stream water. These types of measurements usually require like weekly or biweekly measurements of both rain and precip for multiple years to actually 
be able to back calculate um, a transit time distribution. So these current methods of using uh, trace pollutants like tritium or gases like CFCs and SF6s and stabilized soaps, they all have some drawbacks. The tritium is very coarse with non-unique solutions. Sometimes you can get two different ages with tritium depending on whether your water sample result falls before or after the peak. Um, these gases, uh, CFCs and SF6, um, they cannot be applied to surface waters. You can't just go take a stream water sample and analyze it for these compounds and then calculate an age because the stream water is degassing. You have to do this only in groundwater. And in certain geologic terrains, there are actually natural sources of some of those gases, so that makes it kind of difficult. And then if you do stable isotope analysis approaches like water isotopes, that can work quite well, but you need years of intensive um, rain and runoff sampling. So that brings us to um, cosmic ray uh, produced radionuclides. Okay, so here's just a sort of cartoon of cosmic rays impacting the Earth's atmosphere. This is happening continuously and relatively steadily. And there are a whole host of cosmic ray produced radionuclides uh, in the atmosphere. And many of you have heard of carbon-14. Um, you've got tritium, you've got beryllium-10, chloride-36. There are actually dozens of cosmic ray um, produced radionuclides in the atmosphere. And many of them are used for dating applications. Um, However, only a few of them are used to date water, and that is, would be um, cosmogenic chloride and cosmogenic krypton, which have very long half-lives. They have half-lives on the order of 20 or 30,000 years. So you can't use that to, to determine the, the difference between an age of a decade or two decades or three decades. The half-life is just so, so large. Um, so cosmogenic 22, sodium-22 is in here. It's a naturally produced um, isotope of sodium that's produced relatively continuous in the atmosphere, and um, it is a spallation product of argon. So here's a cosmic ray, cartoon of a cosmic ray coming in, and it typically generates um, secondary particles that can collide with argon, and then this sub subsequently forms sodium-22. And sodium-22 has a half-life of 2.6 years and it is washed out of the atmosphere. All right, so basically every time it rains, including today, um, the rain has trace amounts of sodium-22 in it that are essentially decaying. And you can imagine that once that water goes underground, it's removed from the source term, so it just starts to decay. The sort of radiometric clock has begun. Okay, there we go, sorry. Okay, um, all right, let's do this here. There we go. All right, so here's, there are very few data sets describing cosmogenic sodium-22 in the environment or in environmental samples. Um, there's a uh, Professor Fleischmann who was out in St. Petersburg for most of his career. He put together a data set that, that compiled um, the deposition of cosmogenic so of sodium-22 in total, actually, on the y-axis over time. And you can see that there was a pulse in the 1960s of sodium-22 deposition, just like tritium. So, during the thermonuclear weapons testing era, in the, which was primarily in the late 50s and early 60s, there was a pulse of sodium-22 production and subsequent deposition. And then that largely decayed out, and now you have these steady values. And these steady values out here is the cosmogenic production. So today, all of the thermonuclear produced sodium-22 is gone. It has decayed because the half-life, we've, we've gone 10, 15 half-lives since that time period. So this is what the deposition looks like today. It's pretty much constant from year to year. Okay. So um, to measure this, it's quite difficult. And with the only real analytical solution is to do ultra-low background decay counting. When, when sodium-22 decays, um, it emits a gamma photon that you can see. And the way that we measure this is to put it inside a giant lead shield on an um, intrinsic germanium detector cover the whole thing up with lead and let it count for about a week. And then we can get, we can get a measurement. So the measurement is slow. Um, and we usually have to concentrate lots of water. And I'll go into that in a few minutes. But just to give you an idea of the natural abundance of cosmogenic sodium-22, um, we're talking about something like 10,000 atoms per liter in the rainfall that came down today. So that's on the order of 10 to negative 19 moles. So we're talking about extremely low concentrations in uh, environmental samples. 
So there's just nothing, there, there's very few publications out there describing um, sodium-22 in environmental samples. There was that publication by Fleischmann who showed the weapons pulse and some deposition to St. Petersburg um, in the former Soviet Union um, during the 1980s, but for the most part there have been very few papers on it uh, since then. And in fact, there was recently a, a book, um, a two-volume set of books on the Handbook of Environmental Isotope Geochemistry um, in 2011, and I contributed a chapter um, based on some other radionuclides that I've been, I had been studying. But there's just, it wasn't even mentioned in these two-volume um, two series. So there's just very little out there, and that's what got me interested in starting to look at it. Okay, so we know very little about cosmogenic produced sodium-22, the natural, naturally occurring sodium-22 that was in the rain that came down today. But we do know a fair bit about sodium and the behavior of sodium in the environment. So um, this is a, a chart. I compiled some data that was in um, this book, Biogeochemistry of a Forested Catchment, where they had a bunch of study watersheds across the, across the world and different, in different climates. So rainfall here is plotted on the x-axis. And when you look at the ratio of stream water outputs to precipitation inputs for sodium, the, the ratio is always greater than one, which basically means that um, there's export of sodium and there's very little storage of sodium. And of course, some of these ratios are quite large. You know, there's 12 times more um, sodium that's leaving the catchment here than coming in via precipitation. So that difference has to be chemical weathering. But basically, if you scour the literature and you look at people who have done watershed scale studies on just sodium, elemental sodium, you find that what the streams export is usually greater than what's coming in in precipitation, which suggests that the sodium is following the water through the, through the catchment and it's not being, sticking to anything or forming minerals. And we know that sodium um, dissolves very easily or sodium chloride dissolves very easily and basically sodium minerals rarely form in most environments that aren't like in a desert. So, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that sodium will follow the water through a hydrologic system. Sorry. The clicker is um, disagreeing with me, so I'll try to be careful with it. There we go. That's okay. I think I got it. Okay, so here's a cartoon that could describe how we might think of sodium-22 in the environment. It's formed in the atmosphere via cosmic ray spallation of argon, and then it um, is rained out, and I have these sort of glowing uh, sodium atoms as, as a way to indicate the sodium that's coming out of the rainfall, and then it's going to go through the canopy. It's going to go underground and follow water. It might go into the subsurface. It might hit a stream and follow the stream. It might go into the deep groundwater. Okay, and all along the way, it is decaying with a half-life of 2.6 years, which is a pretty good time scale um, that allows you to potentially tell the difference between water that's five years old, 10 years old, um, et cetera. So that's just a conceptual figure that shows how the sodium might be moving through the system and introduced. All right, so I have um, a few hypotheses to state here. Um, the first hypothesis is that the sodium-22 flux to watersheds is steady and it's controlled by precipitation. Right? Um, and the flux out of watersheds is limited by radioactive decay, and, there, and in many systems that there's very little interaction between sodium and minerals. That may not be true for every single ecosystem, but I'm going to start looking at and describing today systems where that probably is the case. And finally, in temperate regions, the sodium-22 concentration in surface and groundwater is controlled by evapotranspiration and radioactive decay. So if, if water containing sodium-22 goes into a system and there's evapotranspiration, that would serve to enrich the sodium-22 in the water. And at the same time, it will always be decaying with its fixed half-life. Right, so here's a way to conceptualize um, one of these, the first hypothesis, the steady state hypothesis. It rains, right, and you have sodium-22 coming in, and there's going to be some variability. If you have a dry month, there will be no sodium-22 deposition. If you have a, if you have a wetter month, there will be more sodium-22. Deposition. So if you were to look at temporally, you'd expect some variability in the sodium-22 flux. But then the aquifer, it would probably get homogenized and mixed in there a little bit, and the signal would get dampened. And we see that with many tracers, where the precipitation signal um, is dampened once it moves through a watershed. Okay, so that's hypothesis one. 
And of course, the difference between uh, the input and the aquifer uh, is in part radioactive decay. Right? And I'm also going to approach this from a sort of watershed scale um, steady state hypothesis in that the sodium-22 that comes in all right, is essentially going to go into here and then there's going to be some decay and the flux out um, will be basically the same as the flux in except for the decay term. Right? So I drew the arrow in being larger in precipitation. If you have an aquifer that stores the water for five or ten years, the flux out will be a little bit smaller than the flux in and the difference will be radioactive decay. Right? And finally, um, the sodium-22 concentration in the aquifer is going to be controlled by radioactive decay and, and evapotranspiration. So here's an equation. Um, it's basically a derivation of the um, standard decay equation where the sodium-22 concentration in the aquifer divided by the fraction of water remaining is going to be equal to the so initial sodium-22 concentration in rainfall times the decay function. All right, so there's basically two things that are tugging at the concentration of sodium-22 underground, evapotranspiration, which can serve to enrich it, and radioactive decay, which of course could serve to uh, deplete it. So um, with this in mind, um, I'll start to describe some of the studies that we've done um, at William & Mary with some of the students in the geology department. Um, we started to make deposition measurements uh, in Williamsburg, Virginia, okay? And that's where College of William & Mary is. And our mean an annual precipitation is 110 centimeters per year, give or take. And it's relatively steady, and it's relatively evenly distributed across month to month. We don't have a dry season and a wet season. It's pretty much typically pretty wet. Um, and in fact, this, this weekend, we're supposed to get about 10 inches of rain from a hurricane in the weekend. <laughs> so um, there's plenty of water to study in uh, coastal Williamsburg, coastal Virginia. So what we did, you need to collect a lot of water to, to measure sodium-22. Because the abundances are so low, you need to take 50 to 100 liters of water and concentrate the sodium out of that larger volume, just so that we can have enough to see and to actually detect. So we have a, a storage set, a shed, uh, outside our geology building. And we have essentially a 5 meter by 5 meter area that goes into a rain barrel. And every two weeks or four weeks, um, my students go out and they um, collect the water and they put it in this tank. And that tank there holds 60 liters. Okay? And then the next step is to concentrate the sodium-22. I cannot deal with 60, can't put 60 liters on my detector. So I need to strip out and reduce the volume as best as possible. So here's some cation exchange resin. Um, this is Dow X uh, H form uh, ion exchange resin that we put in. We might put in, um, say, 10 or 20 milliliters of it and then stir this up with a magnetic stir bar for a few hours, and then we can filter the resin out. So just from here to here, we've gone from about 60,000 milliliters of rain to 40 mils of resin. So we've done a pretty impressive uh, volumetric reduction right there. And then we can further reduce this by burning it. Cation exchange resin is a plastic, and you can burn it. So I reduce it even further, and you can get it into about a 4 mil volume. So we've gone from 60,000 milliliter sample to a 4 milliliter sample, and it really only takes about two days to do that. All right? The whole time, we can measure total sodium as a yield monitor. The nice thing about cosmogenic sodium-22 is that generic sodium is also out there, right? Sodium-23, the, the more common um, isotope of sodium, and we can measure that in the rain. And we can even measure that in the sample we, before we put the resin in so that we can measure total sodium along this entire analytical path to ensure that we're recovering all of the sodium that we need to. Right? So we can be very quantitative about how much uh, sodium is in here and how many liters of water that quantitatively represents. All right, the next step is to put that small sample, that four mil sample um, that represents, say, 60,000 milliliters of water um, into this uh, ultra-low background germanium detector. So the detector is right inside that copper line chamber. You can see a sort of a circular um, germanium crystal with a black carbon window. And then another 200-pound um, roof goes on top of that. So the sample is shielded from the environment as well as possible. It's not to protect me from the sample. It's to protect the detector from outside radiation. We're trying to just gamma count that little vial that we put on the detector. And this is what a gamma spectrum or part of a gamma spectrum looks like. We can resolve 
the 1275 KeV photo peak um, using this detector. So counts are on the y-axis here, and energy is on the x-axis. And that's what a photo peak looks like after about 50,000 seconds, um, no, 500,000 seconds. So to give you just a general um, approach for the, for the measurement, we take about 60 liters of water, we concentrate the sodium into about four mils, and we count it on a gamma detector for about a week. And then we get a spectrum that looks like this, and we can get a number. We can get atoms of sodium-22. Right? It does take a while. OK, so here's some actual results from about three years of studying with a, um, a, a number of William Mary undergraduate students. Um, this shows is a bar graph showing deposition of cosmogenic sodium-22 over the three-year period that we've been looking at it in Williamsburg. And on the x-axis here is essentially the deposition or the centimeters of rain for winter, spring, summer, and fall. And so you can see that we got about 30 centimeters of precipitation in the winter, and the flux was about 40 millibecquerels per meter squared. And the becquerel is, this, is the SI unit for radioactivity. It is essentially um, a disintegration per second. Okay? So a millibecquerel means a disintegration per thousand seconds. And that's the typical way that we express radioactive isotopes. So you can see that when it rains more, so this is the rain bar is the lighter bar, you get more deposition. And when it rains less, you have less deposition. So for the most part, the deposition is controlled by um, rainfall. Okay? You get a spring maxima, and this is very common, that we get a spring maxima in the deposition of cosmogenic radionuclides. And that is thought to be because there's a little bit of, of folding of the stratosphere and the troposphere, and there's a, just a little bit of an injection of, tr of stratospheric air into the troposphere. And because cosmic ray production is very high in the stratosphere, you can get an injection of stratospheric air in the spring. So this is something that we see approximately every year. All right, so if we plot um, sodium-22 flux in millibecquerels per meter squared, that's how much um, sodium-22 is reaching the surface. Um, and we plot precipitation that we see that it's pretty much additive. The more it rains, the more it comes out. So each of these symbols represents about a two-week collection period. So we had periods where it rained a lot, we had a lot of deposition, and we had periods where it rained a, only a little bit, and we had a smaller amount of deposition. Okay? So what this suggests is that there's a, a fair bit of sodium-22 in the, in the atmosphere, and the removal is really limited by the volume of water that's coming out of the atmosphere. Okay, so going back to the steady state hypothesis, um, we've got atmospheric deposition um, in 2014, 2013, and 2012 here, and here's the flux. And it's, you know, there's, there's an increase in 2013 because it rained more in 2013, but we get, you know, a relatively steady deposition here, and then the question is what's coming out of the aquifer? So if we go to a watershed that's nearby our collection station, what is the discharge out? We know what the flux in is, what is the flux out? So we've got to go to a, a stream now. Okay. So uh, I'm going to take you to um, our first study watershed. It's, in, it's, it's on the college property. <laughs> um, it is a tiny catchment. The watershed area is just under 15 hectares. And a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. This is a forested, low elevation stream draining coastal set, plain sediments, mostly quartz, sand, silt, and just a little bit of clay. There's very little sodium in the regolith which why, is one reason why I like this stream, is that there's hardly any generic sodium in there. So all of the sodium is coming from rainfall. We're very close to the coast, so the rain is loaded with <coughs> sodium from the oceans. Um, and that, we're going to use that as a way to trace the water. So um, there's very little sodium, uh, and I mean total sodium, in the regolith here. All right, and here's, um, well, we can skip that. Um, here's a picture of the stream. It is not a raging stream. Um, there's, my, my current student, Claire Goyden, um, and she's taking a chemistry measurement, and the discharge here in this little tiny stream is about a liter per second. So it's very, very low discharge for base flow. It's slightly acidic. The total dissolved solids are low, less than 10 milligrams per liter, very low conductivity, and very low base flow. So I thought this would be a good place to start studying sodium-22 in streams because there are hardly any solutes in there. There's hardly any um, calcium, potassium. There's some, but it's pretty low. All right, 
So um, the way that we approached this was we needed a water sample. And so there's Elena Burton, um, another one of um, my students who studied on this project. We basically pumped water out of the stream into a carboy. We filtered about, we took about 80 liters of water and took it back to the lab and treated it just like we did the precipitation samples in that we put the resin into the tank, we scavenged out the sodium, and then concentrated the resin uh, onto a filter paper. It was a bit of a pain because um, 80 liters of water weighs a lot, something like 200 pounds. Okay, so here's a plot that shows the stream base flow concentrations of sodium-22 um, in comparison to a lot of the precipitation samples across our study period. And I drew in a volume weighted average line here to just give you a sense for this is what precipitation looks like. Something like 0.15 millibecquerels per liter. And then here's the stream water samples, these larger um, circles here that are slightly filled in. And they came out to be about 0.04 millibecquerels per liter. So this suggests that there's been a fair bit of radioactive decay. Right, given that these are, are considerably lower than the um, meteoric inputs. And we also found that the stream water concentrations are pretty constant um, from June to July to August, September to October. The, the stream is just spitting out 0.04 millibecquerels, um, which again is significantly low the typical um, precipitation signal. So this suggests that we have relatively old water, at least with regards to the half-life of sodium-22. All right, so here is a um, bar graph that shows uh, the fluxes of atmospheric fallout. And again, this is in millibecquerels per meter squared for the three years that we study deposition. And here's the, the base flow stream export. And that is essentially the concentration of the sodium-22 that we measured in the, in the stream times the, the flow of the stream for the whole year. And I'm assuming base flow here. We've just been studying base flow um, just to keep things simple um, for our initial measurements here. And so if you assume that the flux in is equal to the flux out times um, e to the negative lambda t, um, then basically this is, this is just a derivation of the decay equation where you're looking at the amount of sodium-22 that's deposited compared to the amount of sodium-22 that's leaving the system, and we assume that the difference is radioactive decay, we get something like 8 to 11 years for that small 14 uh, to 15 hectare catchment. All right. um, another model that um, we developed to describe the data was um, instead of having a flux model, um, which is essentially the amount of sodium-22 sodium versus the amount of sodium-22 that's going out, um, is we looked at the concentration of sodium-22 divided by total sodium. Um, and we can do this again because the sodium in this system is largely from rainfall. And this serves to, con to um, correct for the fact that there's evapotranspiration all along the flow path. So if you take the sodium-22 in the aquifer divided by the total sodium in the aquifer, it's going to be equal to the sodium-22 deposition divided by the total sodium deposition times the decay term. And you get a, a form that looks approximately like this. Okay? So here, this is, the, this is essentially what precipitation looks like, uh, sodium-22 deposition divided by um, total sodium deposition. And then this is what the stream base flow looked like, um, the total sodium-22 in the aquifer divided by the sodium in the aquifer. It's basically an isotope ratio model that accounts for radioactive decay and evapotranspiration. And it assumes that sodium is coming in from the rain, all the sodium is coming in from the rain um, and leaving through the stream. And there's no uh, chemical weathering inputs of sodium in the system, which I think is OK for a coastal plain system that we were studying. So we get a, a concentration, I'm sorry, an age of about 12 and a half years for the stream. So the, the flux model gave us 8 to 11 years. And the, um, the isotope ratio model gave us about 12 and a half years. It's pretty consistent. And then, of course, we have to figure out what is the actual age? How do we actually test this? So what we did is we used SF6, um, which is this anthropogenic gas that's in the atmosphere. This is what the input function looks like um, based on the US Geological uh, Survey's work on SF6 in the, in the atmosphere um, concentration. And then it's just been going up, essentially, since about 1940. And we sent a sample out to the USGS. We had to go into the groundwater right below the stream. So here's a picture of Elena pumping groundwater from just below the channel. And we filled it in the bottle, did the proper gas collection method. And they said that the age was about 13 years based on SF6. So what we're finding is that um, 
the sodium-22 flux model and the sodium-22 ratio model gave values of recharge ages about 8 to 14 years, and it, corro it was corroborated by the SF6 measurement, which is a completely independent method um, with a, you know, in, done by an independent lab and with a, a separate set of assumptions. So this gave us some um, reason to think that the sodium-22 can be used to date water. So um, since then, we've developed some ways to make this a little bit easier to measure. Because right now, what we have to do, or at least in the work discussed just earlier, we had to literally wagon off um, 80 liters of water or something like that. So several hundred pounds of water had to be removed from the system. And that's just a pain, right? That's just um, a lot of labor. And it's hard to do that in a remote setting if you wanted to go sample someplace that wasn't right next to a road. So um, we started to develop these resin bags. Essentially, imagine a tea bag that you can put in the stream where the tea is cation exchange resin. And what we've done here is we're using a, a polypropylene screen with about a 300 micron mesh size. And we put um, on the order of uh, 80 grams of Dalex H form ion exchange resin that has um, a very consistent bead size of about 600 to 700 microns. And we staple it shut using a high-tech stapler. And we essentially um, put a couple of fishing weights, um, use fishing weights to anchor it into the stream. And we walk away and come back in three days. And um, we found that this can equilibrate with a lot of water that way. And then you just have to walk away with a, a resin pouch about this big instead of um, 200 pounds of water. Okay. So there are some tricks with this uh, method, but I think it will allow us to sample a more diverse set of environments. Um, what we have to do, when you put the mesh um, resin bag into the stream um, and we retrieve it, you can measure total sodium in here and total sodium-22 in units of milligrams for total sodium and millibecquerels for total sodium-22. Um, and then, if we know what the water chemistry was during that time window, we can have, basically, we can easily take a water sample when you put the mesh bag in and calculate, analyze the water for milligrams of sodium per liter. And so the stream water liters that the resin equilibrated with, can, you can quickly calculate that, calculate that by taking the milligrams of sodium in the resin divided by the milligrams per liter of sodium in the stream. So this works for steady conditions. If the stream isn't changing a lot over, say, a two or three day period, and you know you can very accurately calculate just the milligrams per liter of sodium, and then you can measure the total sodium in the bag and the total sodium 22 in the bag, and you can actually get at very good values then for, um, for the concentration of cosmogenic sodium-22 in the stream. And this allows for sort of more uh, remote access sampling. So here's a picture of that resin bag um, sitting in a stream at the Hubbardbrook Experimental Forest. Um, so I started to collaborate with Scott Bailey, who's the US Forest Service um, hydrologist at the Hubbardbrook Experimental Forest. And this is in New Hampshire. And um, you've got a very tiny stream growing, flowing over glacial till. And we put this, the, uh, Scott put the resin bag in the stream right there and left it there for, for about five days. And then he went back and got it. And he got a water sample so that we can calculate the concentration of sodium in the stream at the same time. And we found that um, it equilibrated, in this case, with about 175 liters of water. So this was very easy to analyze for cosmogenic sodium-22 because there was so much water that had equilibrated with that resin. Okay, so the nice thing about the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, maybe some of you know about it, um, it is located in central New Hampshire, and they have been um, collecting measurements of rainfall and through canopy throughfall and groundwater and um, stream water flows and chemistry for 50 years or more. These are very well characterized um, catchments, and it's just so happened that they were doing some transit time studies that. Um, allowed us to sort of equilibrate or calculate um, ages of water and compare it with the sodium-22 values. Um, so as I mentioned, um, here's a picture of some of their um, monitoring equipment. They've got rainfall collectors. They've got canopy throughfall collectors. They've been um, at, at some of these watersheds collecting just tremendous quantities of data that are all available online. Um, uh, if you go to hubbardbrook.org, um, you can access a lot of the LTER data. OK, so we don't know deposition to this. This is, this is um, we're moving to New Hampshire here. And my deposition collector is in Virginia. So we don't actually know flux of sodium-22 to Hubbard Brook. 
Okay? And in fact, if you scour the literature, you find that there's really only a few um, values for depositional fluxes of sodium-22. One was made in Japan um, in the early 2000s by the Sakaguchi group, and it, they came up with an input flux of 210 millibecquerels per meter squared per year. And then there's uh, David Fleischmann, who made measurements in St. Petersburg, who came up with an input flux of about 129 millibecquerels per year. And then our work in southeastern Virginia suggests about 165 millibecquerels per year. That's essentially the global uh, database of sodium-22 depositional measurements over the last couple of decades. And so, you know, how can we extrapolate flux to different places um, is an important thing to consider. So if you were to go to a place where you didn't have a depositional collector, how could you figure out how much sodium-22 was coming out of the sky? Um, here's a plot of these three points. So that's St. Petersburg, Virginia, and Japan on a precipitation versus deposition um, plot. And you can see that actually it's pretty linear, right? If you know the precipitation, that there's a pretty good correlation between precipitation and atmospheric flux. And again, what this suggests is that the more it rains, the more sodium-22 comes out, and actually the atmospheric levels are relatively constant, right? This is all limited by precipitation. So if you actually calculate the actual concentration of sodium-22 in precipitation at these three sites, and you average it, you get 0.17 millibecquerels per liter, plus or minus 0.02, so that's not bad. Three data points allowing you to come up with relatively tightly constrained um, sodium-22 levels in rainfall. So essentially, I, I applied this to Hubbard Brook and said, OK, if we know precipitation, we can calculate flux using just the relationship between some of these data points that have been published. So um, we're going to assume Hubbard Brook has the same rain, um, same 22 as, in rain as in Virginia, but it rains a little bit more in Hubbard Brook, so we're going to scale it by precipitation. And here's um, just the volume weighted um, average sodium-22 concentration that I measured um, with my students at William & Mary. And here is the Hubbard Brook, oh, I apologize. Here's the Hubbard Brook base flow. That's the, that's the concentration of sodium-22 <laughs> that we measured in um, the resin bag that you saw earlier on. And you can see that it's barely decayed. So this suggests that the Hubbard Brook water is actually not as old as the water that we studied uh, in the site at the college. So the problem with Hubbard Brook is that they have a tremendous amount of sodium that's in the system from chemical weathering. So I cannot use the sodium-22 in the aquifer divided by the total sodium in the aquifer. Basically, the isotope ratio model has to go out the window because Hubbard Brook has mineral weathering, especially plagioclase, and that kicks in plenty of sodium that could completely uh, make this, um, this uh, invalid model. Um, but the good news about Hubbard Brook is that, um, I apologize for that, is that they actually have evapotranspiration modeled very well, or actually measured very well. So this just shows across um, the year, from January to November or December, the amount of precipitation, which is the darker bar, versus the amount of runoff. Okay? And you can see that. Um, if you sort of average this out, the, um, the runoff to precipitation ratio is about 0.71. So we know how much water is evaporating out of the ecosystem just because they have, great, um, they have great budgets already nailed out by measuring rainfall each year and measuring runoff um, each year. So if we take the sodium-22 in the aquifer and we divide it by the runoff ratio, you are correcting for evapotranspiration here, and then you can apply it to the dating model. Um, and we find that if we um, take, take this approach, that the Hubbard Brook water came out to be somewhere between 350 and 450 days old, using this um, runoff ratio um, as a way to correct for evapotranspiration, and assuming that the rainfall is pretty similar to what we get in Virginia. All right. And they, um, uh, uh, there's a group of, of, of folks that are studying um, Transit times using water um, isotopes, so here's delta deuterium data. They had weekly and biweekly delta deuterium data from about November 2006 to May 2010. Very high resolution solute chemistry. Um, and there's a paper in, in um, revision right now that is, has come up with some um, ages using essentially signal dampening of the deuterium pulse. Of, I'm sorry, the, the deuterium oxygen, um, the deuterium isotope data. And what they found is that during wet periods at Hubbard Brook, um, the transit times were somewhere in the order of 200, 100 to 200 days, 
But during dry periods, the transit times were somewhere between um, 200 and 500 days. And in fact, when we had the resin bag in there, we had it at the end of August, and we were definitely in a dry period. So our value of 350 to 450 days falls into that pretty well based on the, um, the runoff ratio as a way to correct for evapotranspiration. So we got pretty good results, um, at least based on that one measurement that we did, which makes me um, optimistic that sodium-22 might be a valuable um, way to calculate streamwater age. Let's see if we can get to the last one. All right, so um, to wrap up uh, with some conclusions here, um, Cosmogenic 722 is measurable in meteoric waters and it has a pretty well-defined input function or at least a definable input function. And where sodium behaves conservatively, um, the sodium 22 derived ages of waters are consistent with other established methods. methods. So we showed it corroborated with SF6 um, in Virginia and with basically isotope, uh, water isotope modeling at Hubbard Brook. And overall, um, because the half-life is 2.6 years, and given its chemistry, it appears that the sodium-22 might be a very powerful tracer of um, both water mixing processes and ages on a time scale of about 1 to 15 years. Um, so I was looking for feedback for folks who thought that this could you know, be applied to solve problems um, maybe in Montana or in other places where you have water where you need to characterize either mixing ratios or, um, or ages. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. Thanks for listening. Yes. But I was kind of struck in the difference in the residence time between the Virginia watershed, which was 10 years, and yeah, that's, the public growth, which was a year. That's a great, that's a great point. So um, the thing about Hubbard, do you know much about Hubbard Brook? OK. Um, here's what I would say is that the soils are very thin there, um, barely a meter thick. And so it's mostly coarse till. Let me see if I can get a picture. I mean, that's. It's, it's a stream cutting through till, and the watershed is largely, it, the water is pretty much flowing on till. And so um, the hydraulic conductivity is pretty high. And um, whereas coastal plain Virginia, the soils are many meters thick, and we've got a little bit more clay in there. There's very little clay at Hubbard Brook, but we have more clay um, in the, on the coastal plain. So I'd say the grain sizes are much different. This, this basically the, the texture of the, of the regolith is much different. And so, um, that probably is, that's probably the reason. It's just the, the, the um, very low hydraulic conductivity of the coastal plain sediments compared to, compared to um, fractured granite and glacial till. Yep. So sodium is an important micronutrient in biological systems, and organisms take up, store, and release sodium. So how, how does this play into the That, um, I tell you, that would be a problem. And so that... I, I, you know, I looked at a number of, um, as I said sort of earlier on, I had, you know, I looked at a bunch of these ecosystem scale. I have yet to find a watershed that accumulates atmospheric sodium, let's say that. And I, I looked at um, data from 20 different watershed studies. So I don't doubt that um, there's something, some microbes might use it or there might be some biological uptake. And the question is, is it that a steady, is, is it, is sodium in steady state with respect to those processes? So are the microbes maybe releasing some sodium and taking up sodium is that are, are if the if the ecosystem is in steady state with sodium it would be okay but if you have an aggrading biomass with sodium that would yeah, sink I mean, this sink it. It, it it sounds like a really interesting quite biologist and geologist sure um so it's kind of interesting question that maybe is pretty you know, say you're on a grassland <coughs> versus a forest where a forest might take up some sodium and store it forever and a grassland might be getting rid of it all the time or here in Montana where it takes a pine needle 100 years to degrade. Right. So, uh, I'm just curious if you ever I, a hunk of wood let me tell you this wouldn't work with calcium, I know that. It wouldn't work with potassium. If you look at the ecosystem budgets, people who have measured again ins and outs, at Hubbard Brook they have great sodium data for about 40 years and they show that the amount of sodium leaving the system is essentially the amount that came in and was produced by chemical weathering. There's a really nice balance between the production of sodium and the deposition of sodium and the loss of sodium. There, it's just a, it's a nice balanced system and there's no aggradation of sodium. So um, if, if there was a system that was accumulating sodium on an annual basis, it would completely sink the method. Uh, there's just no doubt. I have yet to find 
good evidence that systems are accumulating sodium on an annual basis, though. I, I, I don't doubt that the sodium is necessary nutrient in some cases, but maybe those are, are fast turnover pools, and I don't know. But maybe it, it's, it's essentially in steady state. I, I, I grow algae. I don't put sodium in the solution they die. So, uh, so how much, and how, the question is then, how, what is the quantity of sodium we're talking about? Is it trivial with regards to the total budgets? It would be proportional to biomass. Proportional to biomass. But not so much as, cal it's not comparable to calcium, though, because calcium gets accumulated probably in larger amounts than sodium, no? I don't have a figure on hand, but it's something that's easy to look up. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate, I appreciate sure. that um, idea because I've been, that, you know, I'm definitely on the lookout for potential complications. It's considered, but, it's considered a micronutrient, so uh, it's, it's a very, very small. I believe it. But again, when I, I looked at, I didn't, I didn't like not plot the data that were below one. Like I couldn't find any any um, watershed scale studies where the export did not exceed the inputs. So I, I have yet to find a system that shows appreciable sodium accumulation. If if I couldn't do the same with potassium, if you look at potassium, many systems are accumulating. The the, the regolith is accumulating potassium in clays and whatnot. So. Um, but thanks for that. Sure, I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. Yes? It's just related to that. You mentioned that if it was in steady state, then it wouldn't be a problem. But uh, wouldn't they be capturing the young sodium and then releasing the old sodium? Well, that, well yeah, that's a, it, whether or not um, there's isotopic dilution, that would be a problem. That's right. So if they took in sodium-22 and spit out sodium-23, that would be an issue. Yes? Yes. And all of your baselines are right next to the ocean. Yes. Is that so it affects total sodium um, in that we have marine aerosols in coastal Virginia. And to me, that actually helps a little bit because then I can use the total sodium as a tracer the whole way. I can use it to, a, to normalize for evapotranspiration. I can also use it to check my yields um, for when I take big water samples. I can make sure I'm recovering everything that I think I am. So. Um, I would say that atmospheric variability in total sodium shouldn't be a problem. What I would worry about is if systems had a lot of sodium in them in clays. Then I would worry about exchange um, and potential isotopic dilution. Did that answer your question? I think so. I was just wondering if, if, if uh, atmospheric abundance of sodium 22 is different than ocean air. Oh, oh no, it's, it shouldn't be because it's argon. Argon is the parent, right? And so there's not a, so you have to worry about the, the distribution of the spallation product, which is, um, or the spallation parent, which is argon. And that's relatively mixed. Yeah, yeah. The bigger thing is that cosmic rays are focused at the poles. So you can get more production of cosmic ray produced um, carbon-14, beryllium-10, et cetera, at polar regions, but only when you're like really Arctic Circle, like mid-latitudes, it's about constant production. But once you get to the poles, it can go up a little bit. But as far as ocean air masses versus continental air masses, the argon should be about the same. And so I don't, I don't expect production to be limited or impacted by an uneven distribution of the argon. But you, could you pick up, like you're picking up sodium out of the ocean, Aerosol. That's total sodium, yeah. 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 But does that have 20 or the radiogenic? It should. I mean, some sodium 22 should go in the oceans, but then I expect that that gets mixed in and diluted. I expect the oceans, it would be very hard to measure sodium 22 in the oceans because there's just so much salt. But I would expect that the oceans are dead just because it's a gigantic volume. And so diff chemical diffusion will just dilute the sodium 22 to negligible quantities. And the production is the atmosphere. I mean, you've got argon up there. So my guess is that sodium-22 from the oceans is trivial. That's, that's my guess. But it would be very hard to measure that. But you know, it makes sense that it would, like when it rains sodium-22 into the ocean, that water gets mixed with a humongous reservoir. And so the sodium-22 gets diluted, I would expect, almost to infinitely small vet levels. Any other questions? Any other questions for Jim?
Well, thanks. All right. Well, thanks yeah. very much. Thank you.